Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, Colombia gets a new president whose family has close ties with the media there. The Washington Post. You think you know America. And the top secret world of American intelligence. But you don't know top secret America. We check in with the supermodel and her appearance at a war crimes trial and a pop movie quiz that's making the rounds on the World Wide Web. Saturday, August 7th, saw the inauguration of Colombia's new president, Juan Manuel Santos, after a landslide election victory in late June. Santos was the defense minister under the former president and key U.S. ally, Alvaro Uribe. Santos says he will stick with most of his controversial ex-boss's policies, but he wants to end the war of words that Uribe had with his neighbor, Venezuela's Hugo Chavez. Colombia is a dangerous place to be a journalist. It's experienced 45 years of civil war between right and left, between paramilitaries and guerrillas. And the media landscape there is highly concentrated, dominated by a few outlets that are owned by some powerful families. Our starting point this week is Bogota. We look at the close connections between the country's media barons and its politicians, as well as the media side of an election that had journalists from all over Latin America and beyond focused on the story. Colombians have handed Juan Manuel Santos a strong mandate. Lots of international media came to Bogota for the inauguration of Juan Manuel Santos. Juan Manuel Santos celebró con su familia. The Colombian conflict, in a way, is seen and filled all around Latin America in different ways. So we have seen lots of journalists from Ecuador, from Venezuela, but also from other countries, from Brazil and from Argentina. All those Latin American journalists were covering a story that was made in Colombia and reported initially and most extensively in the Colombian media, Juan Manuel Santos, which is big business and in the hands of a wealthy few. In Colombia, the, the media landscape unfortunately is very limited. We don't have uh, great media diversity. In, la parte de televisión, in TV, we have two private channels, RCN and Caracol. Caracol. Those two channels have 90% of the television audience and half of the country's annual media advertising revenues. This gives them enormous power. RCN and Caracol are associated with two of Colombia's biggest political dynasties, RCN with the Ardila Lule family and Caracol with the Santo Dominguez family. Both families, both channels, have been influential backers of Santos's and Uribe's party. The radio sector also has concentrated ownership. Two companies are dominant, one of them is RCN. And Colombia's print sector is no more diversified. This country of 40 million people has only two national newspapers, and the reality is that one of them, El Tiempo, reigns supreme, with four times the circulation of its only real rival, El Espectador. And El Tiempo is hardwired to the new president. The family Santos is the owner of 49% of the stocks in El, in El Tiempo newspaper. Juan Manuel Santos comes from this family. So in a way, you have this uncomfortable and inconvenient relationship between government and the press. We know, as is the case across the world, that political and economic elites get their news mainly from the written press. That's not the case for the general public, who are more influenced by TV, by news programs and by the radio. So that's what Colombia's media landscape looks like. One of the strange things about the election story is that much of the media got it wrong. Before the first round of voting, Santos was reported to be running neck and neck in the polls with his chief opponent, Green Party candidate Antanas Mokas, and the media started talking about a green wave. El candidato del Partido Verde ganó fuerza en los últimos días. Despite all those polls, Santos trounced Mokas by more than 25% in the first round of voting. Juan Manuel Santos. The result had some international media wondering what was going on in Colombia concerns that this is a fair election. Other explanations have been offered, all related to media. No le puedo responder. Marcus performed poorly in televised debates, which took place after Santos brought in a new communications guru, Venezuelan right-winger J.J. Rendon, a hired gun well-known for playing key roles in many a Latin American election. When the Venezuelan advisor arrived, he applied very effective communication strategies. 
to tackle the Santos Santo al vacío. To start with, Santos took the lead in dictating the terms of the debate, and Mocas had to go on the defensive. Mocas a la defensiva. The rumors about Mocas started appearing. One of the rumors that did the rounds was that Marcus was an atheist. In a country that is 90% Catholic, that is a politically damaging accusation. No one's ever proved Rendon was behind those stories, but Colombian journalists have a nickname for him, JJ Rumor. One more media angle. Antanas Marcus's rise in the pre-election polls coincided with a big social networking campaign. He was the candidate of new media, or at least it looked that way. It may have been a mirage. Mocus began to represent a hope for zero corruption, culture and education that began growing especially on the internet, on social network sites such as Facebook and Twitter. Facebook and Twitter. Mocus was definitely a phenomenon in Colombia and it became more of a phenomenon through Facebook. Some analysts believe that the campaign just ended up there on Facebook but it actually needed much more work in the streets, work in the neighborhoods. There are various theories but the Colombian media still seem puzzled about how they got the polls, the predictions, so wrong. I think there is really no proper answer to what happened with the polls because everyone was expecting a tie and yet when Juan Manuel Santos wins, it, he almost doubled him. We still don't really understand what happened. It's, it's a task for the media organization to really try to find out what happened, how we got it all wrong. <laughs> don't hold your breath waiting for that to happen. Journalists may have got the numbers wrong in this election, but the vast majority of Colombian media owners and editors have, in Juan Manuel Santos, the man they wanted in office. Precisely how he got there is, for them, of secondary concern. Our Global Village Voice is now on Colombia, politics, and the media. Media portrayal of the Colombian elections ran along two pretty predictable axes. The first was continuity versus change, with Juan Manuel Santos, of course, representing continuity with the Uribe administration. The second was left versus right, and that typically brought in Hugo Chavez and whether the election would be favorable to him or not. With very few exceptions, the quality of the coverage left loads to be desired. Rigorous analysis of the party's manifestos were rare. In-depth critical reporting of the public service records of the would-be presidents were wanting. Moreover, the global media never questioned the existing links between members of Uribe's cabinet and the private interests of Colombia's domestic media. Both the former vice president and the new president of Colombia belonged to the family that traditionally owned the only newspaper with significant national circulation. If you've got an opinion on the way that news is covered that you'd like to get on the air as one of our Global Village Voices, Facebook and Twitter are the best ways to go. We've now got more than 4,300 fans on Facebook. Many of them go there to find out what stories we're working on so they can weigh in with an opinion on the media. Or you can just get in touch with us the old-fashioned way on email. We're at listeningpost at aljazeera.net. Time now for some Listening Post news bites. Rwanda has just held its second presidential election since the 1994 genocide that claimed hundreds of thousands of lives. But the media there have reportedly had difficulty covering the story. According to the Paris-based media watchdog group Reporters Without Borders, something like 30 media outlets were shut down ahead of the election and many journalists were jailed. Media observers have said that President Paul Kagame's administration used a suppressive media law to censor critical reporting. The Rwandan government is denying the charges. It's calling them misguided and overblown. The media remain a touchy issue in Rwanda because many outlets, primarily radio stations, incited some of the hatred that led to the genocide and were used to coordinate death squads. Well, we weren't. You probably won't be. We doubt anybody will be surprised that the Rolling Stone reporter, Michael Hastings, has been barred from embedding with U.S. troops in Afghanistan. Hastings was the reporter behind the Runaway General report in the counterculture magazine back in June that cost General Stanley McChrystal his job as U.S. commander in Afghanistan. 
In the story, Hastings reported that McChrystal and his staff made derogatory remarks about President Obama's strategy in Afghanistan. It was a contentious story that drew criticism from many mainstream media journalists in the U.S. who questioned whether the conversations that Hastings had with the general were on or off the record. The Pentagon is saying that the reason it's barred him is because Hastings could no longer be trusted to abide by its reporting rules. In other words, we're still mad at you and your magazine. There are complaints coming out of Israel over a so-called documentary entitled For the Sake of Nakba. The program aired on Roim Olam, a popular current affairs program on an Israeli state-funded channel. The documentary was critical of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees, known as UNRWA, and focused on the agency's school program. Chris Gunnis, an UNRWA spokesman, tells the Listening Post that the documentary was deliberately misleading. It edited in shots of murals which glorified martyrdom to make it look like they were taken within the school grounds, but they were in fact, according to Gunnis, filmed in the surrounding town. The film also included some anti-Israeli comments made by children who are depicted as students in the school, but Ganas denied that, pointed out that none of them were in school uniform. UNRWA says it complained to the host of the program, but was ignored. The war crimes trial of former Liberian President Charles Taylor has been dragging on for four years in The Hague. Most of it has been ignored by the global media. All it took to change that was some testimony by a supermodel. Naomi Campbell, the British fashion icon, was put on the stand, asked about her relationship with Taylor and how some diamonds came into her possession. And all of a sudden, the media were covering the trial in droves. Campbell, who has a reputation as a temperamental diva, even by supermodel standards, said she considered the whole thing to be an inconvenience and after objecting to some questions by an American reporter from ABC News, ended up taking a swipe at the camera. We're back after the break with a piece on some old-school reporting, mainstream media style. Welcome back. The Washington Post grabbed headlines last month when it released a much ballyhooed investigative series, one that took a long, hard look at the outsourcing of U.S. intelligence work to private companies there. The newspaper branded the series in an intriguing and provocative way. It called it Top Secret America. The accompanying interactive website detailed the names of the companies engaged in the work and it illustrated where the work was being done. Although for the most part, the paper drew on publicly available information, some voices on the political right said that the series posed a threat to U.S. national security and they went after one of the writers involved. And there were complaints from the left that the series didn't go far enough. Al Jazeera's Josh rushing now on an ambitious journalistic exercise that was two years in the making and has critics on both sides of America's political divide. The weekend before the Washington Post released Top Secret America, a story two years in the making, reports of government agencies bracing themselves for its impact began to appear. If you looked at CNN or Fox, whatever, it's like the story that's rocking Washington and it was almost like they were declaring this a blockbuster before they'd even read it. Then, Monday morning, the story hit. You think you know America, but you don't know top secret America. Where is it? It's being built from coast to coast, hidden within some of America's most familiar cities and neighborhoods. American news shows took the story and ran with it. On an explosive new uh, Washington Post report. Washington Post has an incredible series out this morning. And what they discovered is startling. American newspapers have been struggling in recent years to keep up with the changes in the media landscape. But in the case of Top Secret America, the Post came out swinging. The promotion of this story by Dana Priest and Bill Arkin seemed to conjure up images of the Post glory days when an investigation into a break-in at the Watergate Hotel resulted in the resignation of an American president, a Pulitzer for the paper, Woodward, Bernstein, you're both on the story now. and a Hollywood film that canonized the duo of Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. With excerpts from a forthcoming documentary about Priest and Arkin's investigation posted online the same day the story was published, it's almost as if the Post had already created the movie version of their story, and with a PR blitz, its own mythology. They began to build a map trying to identify what some in Washington call the dark side. But if we look beyond the hype, what we see in Top Secret America is an innovative blend of new technology and good old-fashioned reporting. 
Does it take an institution like The Post to pull off something like this? Uh, the mainstream media in the United States is criticized by everybody. And I don't mind that because I think we do plenty of things wrong or lazy or whatever. But we do have the backing of an institution with a fair amount of money. And so they let us take two years to do this. The proverbial blogger in his pajamas sitting at home doesn't have the time, doesn't have the resources, doesn't have the contacts that are necessary to do such an in-depth exploration of what's going on. It takes a mainstream outlet to do it. What it took was the Washington Post teaming up an outside researcher, Arkin, who specializes in the military and intelligence, with a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter, Priest, whose fame and pull could land interviews with U.S. Secretary of Defense Robert Gates and head of the CIA, Leon Panetta. Bill is a researcher like nobody's business. He's so good. He's um, he put together that database. That's something I could never do. I'm a big fan of the mainstream media only because it has a certain kind of ethic that I think is very crucial, which is, you know, no matter what you personally believe, you shouldn't bring it to the, your reporting. And you should be skeptical about government and hold government accountable. Okay, then so, why did you show the government the piece before you published it? Because in the area of national security, you know, I can think about the things that might compromise that, but I'm not inside the system. So we show them that in an effort to say, okay, tell us what your issue is. So in this instance, we ended up not showing the precise location of all the dots on the map. That, according to critics, is one of the ways that top secret America failed to live up to the hype. Well, if you go on the Washington Post website and look up, say, their database on companies, you will see an enormous amount of information. And that's all quite interesting. But in terms of really digging out information like which of these large companies, what do they actually do for, say, the National Security Agency? I think there's an impact of actually obfuscating the role of these companies and making it actually more confusing to figure out what they do. A report that was co-authored by this man, William Arkin. And critics now asking, is if Mr. Arkin has an agenda beyond just journalism. Have you been surprised at how personal the attacks have been against your co-author, William Arkin, by Fox News? This guy uh, is not really a journalist anymore. I mean, he's, a, he's an opinion person, this Bill Arkin, and this guy is so incendiary. I mean, he's a bomb thrower. Some of the commentators on Fox News have taken after Bill before when he's gotten a little high profile. The fun thing about the criticism is that if you actually look at his entire background, you'll see that he's got the most unusual mix of people that he's worked for. This is not a person, Bob, who has any affection for the American military. Is that not something that should be disclosed to the people uh, who are reading the report that he wrote? Once again, it's Fox News creating the controversy as opposed to just covering it. See, it serves their purpose for Megyn Kelly to accuse William Arkin of, of hating the military, of being a bomb thrower. The problem is Megyn Kelly doesn't know William Arkin. I do, and can tell you the last job he had before he came here to the Washington Post to do this project is he was working for the U.S. Air Force. Not a guy who hates the military, but a journalist who knows his stuff. This is a closed community. Well, that's a classic technique of opponents or targets of an investigation. When you can't discredit the message, you discredit the messenger. They haven't challenged any of the accuracy of the reporting itself. So they're sort of flailing around, as they always do, with what's really just an ad hominem attack on the author. I think that it's a good thing to have criticism about the media if it's, you know, thoughtful on either side. Every institution needs to have some pressure from the outside to make it better. And the media is certainly prone to mistakes and should be called out for them and should be doing a better job. And the place that many critics feel the Washington Post should have been doing a better job? Covering national security issues. The Washington Post should have been covering the story all along, particularly on the side of the, of the privatized intelligence industry. There's been this gigantic industry growing by leaps and bounds right under their feet for years. This is a story that's important, but it didn't quite uh, nail the bastards sufficiently that it's really going to go down in history as one of the landmark pieces of reporting. Or, as fellow investigative journalist might say, Watergate, it is not. More Global Village Voices now on the Post's Top Secret America series. 
Media institutions like the Washington Post certainly have more funding to accomplish a project like this, but at the same time, there have been freelance and other journalists working to reveal the same things that the Washington Post has revealed for years. Um, and so while I hope that this is well received by the public, at the same time, I feel like the public has been sort of ignoring um, other information. To have gone out and gathered the information which those two journalists did, and to then be able to absorb it and to work out which parts they should use in the article and finally to know how to tell the story of Top Secret America takes great journalistic experience. Finally, a little something for all you film buffs out there. This is called 35mm. It's a short film about cinema. It's the work of a couple of students at the College of Design and Media in Hanover, Germany. It's a two-minute animated trip through the history of cinema. You might spot some of the references. Titanic, Singing in the Rain, Rear Window, The Terminator. There are 35 films referred to in all, and they come at you pretty quickly over the space of about two minutes, so see how many of them you can pick out in our web video of the week. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post. Sequence start.